to talk to us today. Um, so Anna's talk is um, the abstract uh, is, is, well, the title is called Artificial Intelligence um, at the EU Borders, Ethical Implications of Technological and Political Worlds. Um, I'll let Anna actually explain more about, um, you know, what her paper is as, as she presents. Um, but Anna is a research associate in the computer science, uh, in computer science at the Department of War Studies here at King's College London. And her research has explored the performance of uh, computational linguistic models and the design of ethical, transparent and fair machine learning classifiers. So concerned about the impact that artificial intelligence can have on vulnerable communities, her interest lies in investigating how governmental actors are implementing it. Uh, in the security flows, um, Anna works on the development of digital methods to better understand the production of the data and technology for border security. Uh, and she will also bridge the gap between computer and social science. So fascinating, really important interdisciplinary research. I'm so looking forward to hearing more about it. Anna has kindly agreed um, to actually speak for 40 minutes. We get to really learn in detail what, what her works about because there won't be any discussant for for this talk but um, you know please as audience members ask those important questions I'll be taking diligent notes to be asking Anna at, at the end of uh, her presentation as well too so without oh, further ado Anna I'm going to pass the virtual floor over to you Thank you so much. Um, yeah thank you to you Amanda and the School of Security Studies for inviting me to this event. I'm very honored to share with you today my first contribution to the security flow um, to security flows and artificial intelligence at the EU um, borders. So um, this work is being developed under the security flows um, project. This is a near C consolidated run um, project led by Professor Claudia Aradau. It develops a novel um, interdisciplinary research agenda to um, better understand the process of certification at the border and its epistemic, political, practical, and ethical um, effects. So I've organized this talk as follows. Uh, first, I will introduce the context and motivation of this talk. Then I'll explain the main element related with uh, the ratification of the EU borders. And after I'll, I'll present the main AI-based um, AI solutions implemented nowadays for uh, migration control. Then after that, I'll present the methodology we have developed at Security Flows to um, understand the ratification of these borders by analyzing public procurement documents of two well-known um, EU agencies. And then finally, I'll reflect on the ethics of this technology and end up with uh, conclusions of uh, today's talk. So uh, we will start with introduction, introduction. So nowadays we are witnessing an increasing use of artificial intelligence at borders for migration control. Multi-million euros projects to uh, connect databases with uh, travelers that contains travelers information uh, biometric systems to identify and verify asylum seekers' identities, or even uh, facial recognition technologies to detect deception on travelers' uh, faces. So focusing on the EU context, Frontex and ULISA are the main agencies regarding the datification of the EU borders. On the one hand, Frontex was established in 2004, and um, tasked with border control of the European Schengen area. It has, it has created the first EU uniform uh, body and its budget has been increasing consistently in the um, last year being uh, the budget of, two, of this year, of the current year, um, 543 million euros. Um, on the other hand, um, EULISA was established in 2011, so five and seven years later than, than Frontex. And the, uh, it's, uh, the goal of EULISA is to ensure the operation of large uh, scale IT systems within the area of freedom, security, and justice. Uh, so basically, EULISA is um, designing and implementing all these large database systems that contain information about uh, migratory uh, movement. In, in 2000, in 2000, so last year in 2020, they announced the uh, most expensive contract in its history. 
uh, it was a contract uh, valued in 300 million euros to design a database that is going to control all the border movements of non-citizens, um, non-EU citizens. So um, it is worth noticing that these agencies are operating together, so they collaborate together. Uh, for designing these smart borders for the sake of securitization and efficiency. So despite of the large amount of money that the EU is investing on AI and ratification technologies, I question today uh, whether borders are nowadays uh, smarter than before, than before implementing all this technology, and also are these borders that efficient? So is um, actually technology um, improving or enhancing the um, efficiency of, of, of borders, of, of border control. So uh, focusing on the datification of uh, the EU borders, we have to take into account Dublin regulation. Dublin regulation is a key aspect in the datification process of, uh, of the EU borders. This law uh, determines which EU member states is responsible for the examination of an application for asylum. It basically constrains uh, freedom of, move, of movement of asylum seekers that arrive to Europe. Under this law, EU member states are enforced to fingerprint migrants so that they can be then identify, identify if they travel to other countries. So imagine that you're a migrant that arrived to Spain. Uh, the police officers in Spain will fingerprint uh, you and this fingerprint will be stored in a database. So then um, if you claim asylum in Spain, under the Dublin regulation, Spain is in charge of your asylum case. So then imagine that as um, you have some cousins in France and then you want to travel to France. Um, this under the Dublin regulation is considered like an, an illegal movement because if the French uh, authorities uh, find, this, uh, find you in, in a French territory, they're gonna fingerprint you. And then if they find your fingerprint in this database that, um, they are like um, all the EU members are, are have access and, and, and can um, access to the old fingerprints. So if they find your fingerprint in this database, they can deport you back to Spain because under Dublin regulation, as I said before, uh, Spain is um, responsible uh, for you. So you cannot um, leave the country where you are um, asking for asylum, claiming for asylum. So um, which are these databases? So in uh, the EU context, we have like different databases that contain um, different information. The most relevant in that case um, is Eurodac. Um, Eurodac is this database that gathers information of all asylum seekers that arrive to Europe. And then basically it uh, contains information about names, uh, so biograph biographical information like names, surnames, date of birth, country of origin. It also um, stores fingerprints, as I say before. Um, nowadays, they store fingerprints um, of individuals aged uh, 14, but there is like, a, they are planning to um, gathering uh, fingerprints of uh, children aged six years, like six. Um, they are also, the EU is also planning to store uh, face, uh, face images to um, a part of fingerprint of finger recognition, uh, fingerprint recognition. They want to also um, identify um, individuals through uh, face images. So this is Eurodac. And then we have uh, BIS, uh, this information system. So this, in this case, this other um, database contains information of all the individuals that are um, applying for a visa in, in Europe. And similar to Eurodac, it also contains uh, biographical data like names, and name, date of birth, fingerprints, and also um, the EU is planning to implement facial recognition uh, in this, in this um, database. Finally, we also have the Schengen, Schengen C system, the Schengen information uh, system. And in this case, it contains information regarding criminal um, activities. So it contains images, for instance, of um, individuals that are related with a criminal investigation. It also contains genetic um, data. Uh, it also contains fingerprints, uh, information of, for instance, like objects like a car or um, tattoos, uh, et cetera, et cetera. 
And then um, the next um, database I, would, I wanted to present today is the entry exit system that is going to be in force next year. So the EU plan to um, implement this uh, system this year, but um, it has been uh, delayed. Uh, we still don't know why. They, they sometimes say that it's because of COVID. They sometimes say that it's because of, you know, implementing all this um, technology is not that easy as you know, you might, you might, you might think. So in this case, the entry exit system is gonna um, gather information of all non-citizen, non-EU citizens that um, are will are gonna are closing uh, borders. So in that case, um, the authorities will know when your uh, visa expires and if you are um, illegally like in in the European um, Union. So how these um, databases are impacting on people's life? In this slide, you can find a text that we found um, that we found in a document of uh, an asylum uh, application. And in this case, the judge the judge was saying that um, this asylum seeker was like he, um, his uh, application was denied because. Uh, the judge found that in uh, Eurodac it was his fingerprint and he was fingerprinted in 2016 while um, the asylum seeker was saying that he left um, his country of origin in 2017. So as the judge found this um, incoherence between um, the narrative of, of the asylum seeker and the Eurodac um, information, he uh, says that um, this evidence undermines the credibility of his entire account and, and his credibility. So um, the result was that the judge denied uh, the, this case. In, uh, we also found this other case in this um, paper um, published uh, and authored by Georges Glo um, by, by George's Glofutius. And they were investigating how in Germany these um, systems were also like impacting on, on migrants' life. And in this case, um, they witnessed a case where a pregnant woman was um, asking for a visa to stay in Germany. And uh, what happened is that the authorities in this case found like a very similar um, in instance uh, in the VIS system. Uh, in this case, like uh, they fingerprint that, that um, pregnant woman and they found like a similar fingerprint in this system, but the names were like slightly different, right? Like she was saying that um, her name was Marie V, but then in that system and in the VIS database, um, the name that appeared was Mabel V. So they started like uh, uh, interrogating her despite of um, her, um, her health, um, Started, right as a, as a pregnant woman and so in these two cases we are like um, identifying and analyzing and examining how these systems this um, database system are impacting or in this case asylum seekers and, and, and migrants so but how what is artificial intelligence and how is nowadays artificial intelligence um, used um, at the border and, and implementing so before starting analyzing AI at the border, I wanted to bring this question. Um, what is artificial intelligence? So to ask, um, to respond to this, this question, I would like to first um, ask what is intelligent, right? And we found on the, on the literature, there is no consensus about what is intelligence because we, we know that there are like six different types of technology of intelligence, sorry. So if we are not able to define what is intelligence, how can we be able to um, define artificial, artificial intelligence, right? Um, but however, the European Commission, the experts of, of um, the, the group of experts in AI came up last year with this definition of artificial intelligence that says that uh, artificial intelligence systems are software designed by humans and uh, they act in the physical or digital dim dimension through data, um, data acquisition. And then they process this information and they can decide the best action to take in order to achieve uh, a goal. And I have some concerns because, uh, with this definition 
because first of all, this goal that the artificial intelligence uh, have to achieve doesn't need to be complex. It can be a very simple um, goal. Secondly, um, artificial intelligence cannot perceive um, the environment. It just like analyze data. And it's true that data uh, can be like representation, a digital representation of our environment, but it doesn't perceive the environment as we as a human beings or all animals can perceive environment. And uh, finally, um, reasoning. Artificial intelligence cannot um, reason. Like uh, artif artificial intelligence is just based on uh, mathematical formulas that try to optimize uh, a, a problem in order to achieve this goal. So it doesn't reason, it's just like computation, uh, mathematical computations that, computer, that computers can run in a very uh, efficient uh, way, right? And uh, recently there has been also a controversy towards this concept of artificial intelligence because um, we are aware that artificial intelligence is not artificial neither intelligent. It's not artificial, artificial because first of all, it's made of natural resources. Uh, so in order to implement artificial intelligence, you need a computer and to have a computer, you need uh, natural resources. And then you, go, you need to go to the, to the ground in, uh, to take these natural resources to design your computer where you are gonna implement this artificial intelligence. So it's not very artificial because it depends on you too. And then it's not intelligent because as, as I say before, um, it just like run mathematical, mathematical computation. So if we consider that um, the um, computing all these mathematical fu functions is intelligent, then we could agree that we consider that artificial intelligence is intelligent because it can solve these mathematical formula, formulas. Otherwise, um, we like if we consider intelligence as you know social intelligence or music, uh, musical intelligence, we cannot consider that artificial intelligence is intelligent by design. And also I wanted to bring today um, this um, graph that clearly shows the different uh, concepts, uh, key concepts of artificial intelligence. So artificial, artificial intelligence, as you might know, is a subfield of uh, computer science. And then within this field, uh, we can find uh, machine learning, which aims at um, analyzing patterns in um, trends in a uh, big data, data set. Then uh, within machine learning, we also have this other subfield of artificial intelligence that it's um, named deep learning. And deep learning is basically uh, when you take a machine learning algorithm, but um, you make it a bit more complicated. You um, implement more like lawyers into this algorithm in order to, for instance, um, analyze uh, an image. Because like machine, um, usually machine learning algorithms are not able to analyze um, images or text or uh, other type of, of information of data, of data, while deep learning was um, designed uh, specifically to analyze this other type of, of data. So um, in this specific field, we can find biometrics. Uh, most of the algorithms, most of the biometric systems that are implemented nowadays are based in deep learning algorithms. And then uh, next to artificial intelligence, but it's not within this, uh, the, uh, this um, subfield, we can find data science and big data. So data science is uh, this field also like in, uh, in computer science that focus on um, designing uh, approaches to deal with data and uh, we, can, we can also find like um, data engineering that is focused on um, how um, you design your data set so that uh, you, an algorithm can analyze all this data. And then we also find this other uh, field which is big data. And I see that because sometimes we confuse this, these three concepts, right? AI, data science, and big data. And I wanted to show here that there are like slightly different uh, concepts. So big data focus on um, designing algorithms that can process a big amount of, uh, of information. So when you have like a big data set, usually uh, classic machine learning algorithms or other like type of algorithms cannot process 
all this information um, in just one run. So with big data um, approaches, what you can do is like to divide this data set, this big data set in different, in different sets. And then you implement the algorithm par, um, in a parallel structure, and then you can analyze then uh, at the end, right? So it's basically these approaches that can um, divide uh, this big data set into small data sets, so the algorithm can be uh, implemented there. So which projects are nowadays used, um, which AI-based projects are nowadays used at the EU border? In this, in this um, document that you can find, um, online, I share the uh, link to this um, document that was released this summer, analyzing AI, um, AI at the EU border. You can find like a broad su summary of the different solutions that are nowadays implementing. Some of them have been canceled because of ethical concerns. Um, some of them have been penalized as the AI border control, which is this project um, funded by the AIDS 2020 scheme where they were developing um, technologies to, um, to make um, border smart. smart. Um, um, so in this talk, I wanted to focus on biometric systems. So biometric system is, as I explained before, a subfield of AI uh, because it uses deep learning algorithms. And how it works is as follows. So, um, you have like a data set with a lot of um, a, a lot of, for instance, fingerprints, and then what you want to analyze is the similarity between uh, fingerprints. So that if you got like a, a similarity score very high, that means that these two fingerprints might uh, correspond to the same individual, right? So once you train this system. Uh, when you have a new fingerprint, you can compare this new fingerprint with all the fingerprints that you have in, in, in your database. And then the system um, has learned how to extract the patterns and how to analyze the similarity between these two um, images. And then it, it finally, it got like a score of similarity. And based on this score, as I said before, if it's very high, it's gonna, it's gonna say, these two fingerprints belong to the same person. It's like a genuine, um, it's a genuine attempt, right? When the system says, uh, the system gets on a score that is very low, it's below a threshold, then it says that in this case, there is an imposter case. And this might happen when um, the two fingerprints belong to different persons. But uh, we have to realize that algorithms are not 100 precise at all. Um, they will always be a percentage of errors. And the errors that biometric systems um, commits are, uh, can be classified in two types of errors. So the first one are the false match, FM. And this corresponds when two pieces of biometric data from different people are just to be from the same person. So in that case, the system says that they belong to the same person when actually they don't belong to the same person. And uh, secondly, um, we also have the false, uh, false non-match. And this happened when two pieces of biometric data from the same person are just to be from different person. So what happened nowadays is that in the EU, there is a critical lack of accountability of uh, biometric systems deployed in uh, the databases that I explained before. So if you remember the cases that I, the case studies that I presented today, that um, that asylum seeker that got that rejection from the UK government, or that women um, asking for a visa in in Germany, they could be false. Uh, they, they could be false match. So that the judge found this um, fingerprint in Eurodac doesn't mean that um, it corresponds to the same individual. It could have a false uh, a false match. It could belong to another different person. And what we are analyzing now, um, now in security flows is this guy, is this type of errors. Why don't we have this? Um, uh, we, we want to create this awareness towards the use of biometric systems in these uh, very sensitive cases. So um, to better understand and analyze the bio, bi biometric systems that are being deployed uh, in the EU. We have um, came up at security flows with this methodology um, to better understand um, 
or like who is creating, who is designing these, these biometric systems in, in the EU borders, how much money is investing on these technologies, and how well, how connected are these um, private actors. So, and to do that, um, we have first like analyze and upload um, all the contracts on the public procurement documents uh, from the e-tendering e platform, which is the EU platform where you can find all the contract award notices and they are publicly, publicly available. So after we download all these documents or these contracts, we structure uh, the contracts into a database because algorithms cannot uh, automatically analyze um, text. So you have to give to this information a structure and the structure that we have um, we have given is a data set with where every row is a contract and then every column, every feature, feature is um, a section of this, of this contract saying, for instance, the contracting authority, the company that won this contract, how much money, the ID of the contract, the title, the title and uh, the summary. Um, then once this um, information is uh, structured, uh, we clean the data, and then after we clean the data, we run these visualizations in order to better understand the relationship between the notification of the new orders and the connection with the uh, private sector. So basically, uh, we wanted to answer these three questions, which are how much money has been invested in the EU borders, which are the most expensive contra contracts, and which are the most our contractors. So um, after uh, we um, gather the information and structure the information, we um, work on these visualizations where we are showing uh, how much uh, money has been invested in the private sector. So on the left, um, left hand, you will find uh, the information, the data for 22 EU visa. And you can see that um, the budget has been increasing over the, over the years. Uh, and also the same trend can be identified identify in uh, Frontex contracts. Um, also, we have analyzed the type of contracts and we found that, for instance, ULISA invests basically on IT systems. So they um, award contracts um, to design and maintain IT systems, while Frontex has like, a, it, it, they invest in more heterogeneous type of contract. Like you can find also like software, um, so, software um, solutions, but also the portation flights, they invest a lot of money in the portation flights or surveillance um, technologies like um, um, drones. So which are the most expensive, expensive contracts? In ULISA, uh, last year, they released this uh, contract to design and implement the entry exit system. And it was a work with more than uh, 300 million of euros. Um, the second most expensive contract was related with the maintenance of this. And what happened is that when you implement these database systems, they used to be, um, they need to be maintained. Like for instance, they run out of memory because they source too much information. So they run out of memory. So they need to release these contracts in order to update the memory of, of these systems. And also interoperability. Uh, interoperability corresponds to the uh, third more expensive contract by Ulisa. And this concept, so what they are planning to do is like to connect different like databases, national and international, in order to share um, more information yeah, for um, border control. On the other hand, the most expensive contract of Frontex is uh, this contract that they, are, that they released in last year also for um, hiring iCraft systems for maritime aerial surveillance. So um, basically Frontex is investing money on drones and airplanes, uh, airplanes for surveilling um, the, the, the EU borders. Um, the second most, uh, uh, most expensive contract was related with um, return um, flights. So basically deportation flights to the poor um, migrants. And who are the most, uh, which are the most of our contractors? So we found, for instance, that in Ulisa, um, Idemia, Superstudia are two very uh, well-known um, actors, private actors in this context. Um, they usually got all the contracts uh, to design and implement 
uh, Eurodac, BIS, uh, CIS. And then uh, on Frontex, we find that there is like more heterogeneous um, private actors. So we find all these um, companies uh, related with aviation to um, develop this uh, maritime and aerial surveillance, surveillance systems, but also we can find uh, traveling agencies um, and uh, these companies are related with these deportation flights contracts. So we wanted to analyze the connection between uh, private actors because we found that usually they don't uh, they cooperate between them. So when they apply to one of these um, tenders, they apply together as a consortium, as a group of economic actors. And this is what we can see in the connections in, the, in this network um, visualization that shows um, when like um, companies apply together into a contract. So we can see that um, 3M Belgium, Superstereo, Bull, Atos are like um, companies in the ULISA contract ecosystem that used to apply together and they got basically the most um, expensive um, contracts. While in Frontex, we see that um, the network is more dispersed and we found all these different clusters of uh, private companies. So also with the methodology, we were able to analyze how much money has been invested in these four database systems. So uh, the most expensive, and as I said before, is the EES that uh, was awarded, this contract was awarded by Superstia, to Superstia and Idemia with more than 300 million euros. And then uh, Superstia was also in the contracts of TIS and Eurodac. Uh, and well, in this table, you can see a summary of how much money and to which companies um, have been awarded. So through this methodology, uh, we were also able to um, analyze and get more details about the biometric systems that are implementing are implemented nowadays in these um, in these large databases. And as we know that, for instance, in um, in Eurodac or in the NGX system, Soprasteria and Avimia are the ones that, who are gonna design or are maintaining these systems. We were able to analyze um, the metrics of the biometric systems that are implementing in these databases. So in this case, uh, this uh, plot shows the error by ethnicity of the facial recognition algorithm developed by Avimia. And we can see that there are like slightly like um, differences. So there's a disparate impact on uh, the difference of gender and ethnicity. So for instance, we can see that um, errors are larger based on, are larger on, on female uh, compared to males. And also if we analyze this from an intersectionality perspective, we see that Indian women um, errors are um, higher than, for instance, white uh, females. Also using this methodology, we were able to um, identify and detect other AI solutions that, uh, in this case, Frontex is investing. And we came up with this, um, um, we came up with this AI-based uh, product that Frontex has, in, um, has invested more than 2 million euros and is a system that is going to predict the risk of uh, the risk of vessels in uh, the Mediterranean Sea. So they are developing this um, system where they are going to connect different databases containing information about vessels and then the system will give to the user a risk score. We don't really know um, the terms of this risk uh, concept, so risk in terms of what, we, we still don't know that. And um, it's also like relevant to, to stress that it has been awarded to an um, Israel company. And also like uh, Frontex and other agencies like IASO are um, in, uh, investing resources to try to forecast migration flows. And in this uh, case, we see this um, system, this approach um, using data from Frontex and IASO and Google Trends and social media to try to uh, forecast migration flows. So as a computer scientist, I, I asked myself, like, can we forecast migration flows? 
And the, question, and the answer is no. It's very difficult to um, forecast migration flows with a high uh, percentage of, of uh, accuracy. And uh, we see here in that plot that, um, so the black line corresponds to the truth, so the, um, the ground truth of the migration flows. And then the red line corresponds to the prediction of, of the system. And we can see that um, the lines differ a lot. So it's very hard to uh, try to um, forecast um, complex, um, complex social um, activities or events like migration flows. Like AI is not gonna, um, it's, it, it won't never like develop a system that is super accurate to um, forecast this type of, of social events. So moving towards ethics, um, when we talk about ethics of AI at the border, uh, we usually discuss uh, algorithmic discrimination and bias, accountability, the accountability of the systems, transparency and explainability of these algorithms used at the border. Um, but we, I think that with this um, debate, we have to go beyond and we have to um, discuss our ethics, uh, our borders ethics by design. Uh, because I um, in this project, I realized that AI is just another lawyer, a liar to um, that is using in the border. So basically, I I propose to move uh, this debate on AI at the borders to our borders ethics per, uh, by design. And so to sum up. Um, yeah, so today I present the databases and biometrics uh, systems that are widely applied at the EU borders to criminalize uh, migrants. Uh, that there is a need to analyze the impact and human rights violations of these systems because we are not aware that they are not 100% accurate and that they um, have um, errors and we have to be aware when we are implementing this in this uh, context, in the migration contracts. And for this, to analyze these implications, we need interdisciplinary teams. So teams made of computer scientists, lawyer experts, and social scientists that can analyze um, this scenario. And finally, as I showed today also, there is a lack of transparency and accountability of uh, all the solutions developed uh, by the uh, private sector, because we don't know uh, still which are the metrics of these uh, biometric systems, or how they are um, developing these uh, other uh, solutions. So thank you so much. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward for your uh, questions and feedback. Great, Anna, thank you so much. What a fascinating talk. I'm just going to try and, and change the, the view here um, so we can see oh good we have a few questions i have questions but i'm going to try not abuse my position of chair and, and open it up to the audience as well too so okay um carolyn gibson says very interesting would be interested to tie this research to the un security council resolution on women peace and security as a mechanism of applying the the research uh to action as well too um yeah, I mean, Carolyn, that's a really interesting point. And I think this is what, you know, um, more uh, feminists who, who research on WPS talk about, you know, how you know, the WPS agenda is still very much state centric um, and doesn't necessarily apply the private sector, but also the idea that, you know, women migrants or refugees are on the move, right? Um, so, uh, I guess, yeah, for me too, that's a really interesting point to reflect on. Have you thought about how, you know, your research and AI technology borders, how that fits in with um, the UN's um, resolution and the UN's, I, I guess, broader action plans around women, peace and security? Yeah, so I think that um, this year the UN released this um, report analyzing discrimination at the EU borders um, te using technology, and it's very inter uh, and it's very interesting because they talk about discrimination, they talk uh, about algorithmic discrimination, they also talk about connections of technology at the border and private and the private and private companies. So I think that the UN, um, yeah, is being you know more. Um, 
they are analyzing this all these um, scenario, right? And also like talking about um, the EU this year uh, in April 2021, they released the first legal framework to regulate AI. So I think that this is going to be the trend that we will see in the incoming month, like all these um, national and international organizations creating this awareness towards biometric systems, AI. Um, recently has been also a discussion about facial recognition at the European Parliament, and they want to ban the use of biometric uh, systems in, in, in the public spaces. So I really think this is going to be a trend in the incoming month. Yeah. I, um, oh, Clemens is asking um, a question around, I guess, procurement. He says in the procurement contracts, did you actually find that the EU awards contracts to technologies emerging from Horizon projects? Or are these coming more from an exclusively private side? And then I guess I extend, a, and, and Clemens won't be surprised by my question too, is um, yeah, like unpacking this relation. Is it even useful, I guess, as, you know, Rita Abrahamson, for example, talks about, you know, security assemblages, right? Is it even useful to unpack state versus private? Like what sort of relationship is going on there and when we're thinking about innovation and development of these particular technologies? So that's my tag on question to Clemens. Yeah, so we have to think that all the digitalization in governments are related with a private company because uh, the government, they don't have the resources to develop all this certification on all this digitally, um, digitalized technology, right? So every time that the process is being digitalized in, uh, in governments or in the welfare system or in at the borders, there is a private company that is taking this contract and is developing this technology. So this is um, related, this is uh, highly related. So every time that we want to analyze a system, we will find a, tech, a private company who is developing this system for the government or another you know, authority. So regarding the procurement uh, methodology, we focus only on the contracts, uh, private contracts, right? So all these contracts that the these two agencies are releasing and are awarding, uh, we didn't connect. We didn't connect these contracts with the eight twenty twenty um, program because this program is more related with um, researchers. So I know that also like private companies can be yeah, awarded under this scheme. But uh, yeah, we haven't we haven't um, matched um, all this information. Although my colleague Sarah Perret has recently published uh, a paper analyzing all um, Horizon 2020 projects uh, um, related with uh, the border control, right? And I found, um, because I'm familiar with um, some companies' names, and I found, for instance, some companies that appear in both um, in both contracts, so in H2020 project and also in the contract that uh, we analyze. Great. Um, Alvina has a question she's going to ask live. So I think you can do that now, Alvina. Great. Thank you so much, Amanda. And thank you so much, Anna. This is really, really fascinating. You know, I'm a big fan of your work and it's always nice to kind of see you talk about it and have these beautiful slides. Um, just a quick maybe comment about the UN question, uh, which I found really fascinating raised. I think it's important to know that it's not like an official UN report, but it's actually special rapporteurs who are writing these reports. So they are kind of, they're not paid by the UN and they're able to be really, really critical and do this kind of critical analysis. Sort of, you know, the UN, UN might be quite happy to claim that they have these really critical human rights experts out there critiquing, you know, problematic practices. But um, yeah, so it's quite important to see, you know, how does the EU and the UN interact in these more institutionalized spaces and how do people claim or are able to kind of distance themselves from these institutional dynamics in their kind of more activist human rights uh, lawyer um, or having them more activist human rights lawyer hats on. Um, that aside, let me ask you three questions. Um, one is about the definition of, of AI proposed by the European Commission, which I find really interesting because, as you said, the literature, we as social scientists or computer scientists know there is no fixed definition. And yet, 
what is the effect of proposing such a kind of static, almost uh, once and for all definition that kind of removes all struggles around trying to define AI and um, who is part of you know, defining what AI is? Um, again, are social scientists, other kinds of academics part of this debate or not? Um, because the EU kind of uh, traditionally tries to exclude uh, academics from talking about these issues of security. Um, my second question is about um, interoperability and trying to connect national and international databases. Um, again, it's sort of proposed as if it's just you know an easy move. Let's just connect all of them, and we have even more data to work with. Um, but um, some of the discussions I've been following with actually said it's quite problematic because there are so many differences in the day-to-day -day collection, how people actually collect, collect this data, might make a lot of errors. There is no systemic kind of approach to this. And so they're actually dealing with really kind of banal problems almost, like we have to train these officers and before we're even able to kind of harmonize all these different national databases. So I'd like you to reflect a little bit more on this kind of banal almost day-to-day -day administrative reality of collecting data um, before it even becomes presented in these nice um, databases. Um, and finally, could you expand on your last point? Uh, as you said, you'd like to kind of provoke this thing about, um, I think you said borders are ethics by design. Can you expand on that notion a little bit? I think that sounds um, really fascinating. Um, thanks so much. Thank you, Alvina. Uh, wow, <laughs> thank you so much for your reflection. Um, yeah, I also, I like talking about your reflection on the UN question. Um, so I also find like, I find kind of incoherencies with, with these authorities narrative because uh, for instance, like um, the EU is saying that they want to ban the use of uh, biometric systems in public spaces. But on the other hand, they have um, implemented all these um, database systems that are taking fingerprints and they want to implement facial recognition on migrants. So it's like this two narrative for me is like a bit like of incoherence, right? Because on the one hand, you're saying that you're gonna ban uh, facial recognition in public spaces, but on the other hand, you're using facial recognition at the border. So um, yeah, it's so interesting to analyze these, these cases. And um, so answering your first question regarding the definition of AI, it's uh, very interesting and thank you for uh, bringing this to the conversation because if you analyze who is uh, who define or who propose uh, the team that proposed this definition of AI is a team basically made of uh, people working in private companies and there are only like few academics and also if we analyze gender or the ethnicity of this team we will find that it's basically uh, white uh, males. So thank you for bringing this to the discussion. Regarding interoperability, I'm a bit um, skeptical about this um, project that the European Union is investing a lot of uh, money because I don't think it's going to happen. Like when um, you really know how like how you, you merge two databases, you see how difficult it is. And it's more difficult if, um, you know, you, Alvina, you create your own database, and then uh, me, Anna, uh, I create my own database, and then one day we decide to uh, merge it together. It's very difficult because you will use your own system, I will use my own system, you will use your own code to, you know, create your ID column, I will create my own IDs to create my uh, column. So it's very difficult to uh, merge all these different database um, systems at both level, national and international. Um, so I'm quite skeptical. And also like if you analyze how like different authorities work um, nationally, like I'm getting very familiar with the different databases that they are using in Spain regarding migration. And for instance, um, so in Spain, we have like two kind of authorities. One is Policia Nacional and the other is Guardia Civil. And they have their own systems and they don't share the information between them. They are quite skeptical and they're also like quite skeptical to share this information with other authorities like, like Frontex. So if there is all this, um, if you analyze all these uh, cases, I really think that interoperability is not going to happen. But yeah, I, I can't be wrong, absolutely. And then regarding border um, ethics, and uh, you know my my reflection on on um, ethics of AI at the border and uh, and and borders questioning like if borders are ethics by design. So 
I bring this discussion because I'm a migrant. I'm a privileged migrant in the UK because you know I have my other right to, to work here. But I can see how like borders are discriminative by design. So basically, using an algorithm to discriminate um, to discriminate nationalities is just like another layer another layer in this scenario. And um, I'm gonna explain the case of the of the UK visa system that was deployed two years ago by the Home Office. And then um, it was uh, scrapped because uh, an organization in the UK found that it was discriminating African nationality. So basically they were um, implementing an algorithm to assess visas uh, in the UK. And they found that the algorithm was um, given like a high score of rejection to um, African nationalities. So they um, stopped um, using this um, algorithm system. And, but my question is like, okay, you stop using this system, this algorithm, but this system, this algorithm also like show, show how like before using um, this artificial intelligence solution, you were also discriminating because what they were like to train this system, they were using data, data of previous cases um, of, of visas, right? And then if the um, an algorithm is basically uh, analyzing patterns and if they found like this system found the pattern that um, African go like a higher um, score of being rejected, this is telling that borders are discriminated by design because they were discrimin um, discriminating African people before the implementation of, of this system. That's great. Um, and maybe this is just a really naive question. So I apologize for that in advance, but um, you know, I think yeah, I, I, borders as discriminatory, um, that, that seems to be a pretty established critique, at least in critical security studies and whatnot, right? And I guess, um, you know, maybe, I don't, I don't know if you have any suggestions, but what do we do, right? Like given all of the, given, you know, kind of the, your important critique of AI, important critique of, of borders being discriminatory, um, is there, I, I don't know, is there any sort of um, ways in which I, our AI technology can, um, you know, can work in a way that, uh, you know, um, reduces the, the discrimination, reduces the, you know, these, these um, um, social injustices that, that you've highlighted so well? Yeah, I don't know, no, that's, that's a question. That's a fascinating, fascinating question. So I really think that AI could be used as a way of accountability. So in the case that I explained before with the UK visa system, so the algorithm found the pattern that African nationalities were being um, discriminated in the past. So the algorithm was showing this, um, this fact. So I do think that AI can be used as, as um, a way of uh, accounting, right? I also like analyze police data in the US, uh, in, in London because uh, all the data sets are like open source. And I found that for instance, um, police data is biased. So they store more like black people than white people. They um, have more activities. Um, they are more present in um, poor neighbors and rich neighbors in uh, neighborhoods in, in, in London. So I think, I do think that algorithms and AI can be used as a way of accounting and making more explicit uh, our social injustice because it's a way of quantifying this discrimination. Yeah, and like you've highlighted with the UK border, making mm -hmm. that much more visible, right? Rendering yeah. that while moving it from kind of subjective decisions paperwork to something that, like you said, has a clear pattern and algorithm. So thank you so much for um, your fascinating talk. Um, I've I learned so much. It looks like from, from the, the comments that everyone has learned a great deal from you. So I look forward to seeing this materialize into a paper, a book, or, or um, uh, something else in the prints. Um, I, um, and I wanna thank the audience for, for participating, for engaging, and for making this series um, such a vibrant space to exchange ideas.